seated above, enthroned in the Father's love. Destined to die, poured out for all mankind. God's only Son, perfect and spotless. Never sinned, suffered as if he did. All authority, every victory, joy, all
Heavenly Father, God, we just come before you this morning. And, uh, we thank you, God, for who you are and, and for the realness uh, that, that we have in our life of you and the evidence that we have, God. We just pray that you'd be with the remainder of the service this morning. We just pray that you'd be with Tony as he brings the message, God. We just pray that you would be with all the guys that are working in Children's Church and in the nursery, God. We just pray that you would show up in there today with those guys, God. We just pray that there's someone here that doesn't know you, that they would come to know you this morning in salvation, God. We just uh, pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning and welcome to New Hope Baptist Church. We are delighted that you are here this morning and uh, we just want to be a help and encouragement to you in any way that we can. And so if you are visiting with us for the first time, we invite you to fill out this contact card that's attached to your bulletin. You can tear that off and drop it in the offing plate at the end of the service. You can use that contact card for a few other things you'll see there on the other side, including prayer requests, or if there's any way in which we can help you, please let us know. But we trust that you will feel right at church this morning, and that you have come prepared to let the Holy Spirit do a work in your heart and life. In just a moment, we're going to uh, dismiss Children's Church. We have a Children's Church program. It's designed for children kindergarten through about third or fourth grade. And you're invited uh, to send your children to Children's Church. If you haven't been there before, your children haven't been there before, you're welcome to go with them and check it out, see what it's like. But at this time, we will dismiss Children's Church. And that is in hallway number three. That is back to my left. In the back corner to your right, and we'll dismiss kiddos. And now you have a little more elbow room. And I'm going to ask everyone if you would please stand together for our Bible reading this morning. Our Bible reading comes from Revelation chapter 3 and verse 19. I trust you have your Bible with you this morning. Revelation chapter 3 and... Verses number 19 and 20, the Bible says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. And let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for the, uh, this place that we can come and assemble together. We thank you for a pastor that preaches the truth in love. We ask that you would go from heart to heart this morning and that you would give us the uh, encouragement or uh, the conviction or the um, edifying, whatever we need this morning, Lord, both individually and collectively, that our hearts would be in tune to you. We'll thank you for all you accomplish. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank 
And this passage covers what I believe today, and I don't, I don't use this lightly, what I believe today is the number one sin in the church. You're going to see it in the, in the message to the seven churches in Revelation chapter number three. It's the number one sin in the church because it disobeys the number one commandment of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was asked, what is the number one commandment? This we're going to find in Revelation and chapter number three and verse number 19. Revelation chapter number three and verse number 19. Here's a door that Jesus says is ready to be opened. It's ready to be stepped through. Revelation chapter number 3, verse number 19, our text verse, say this. As many as I love, Jesus said, I love you, and therefore I rebuke and chasten you. Now this verse, verse number 19 and 20, was written to a church uh, in John, uh, in the book of Revelation, the church of the Laodiceans. Uh, the church in Laodicea. Laodicea was a very rich place. It was a place of business. It was a, a place of uh, uh, where people were very busy and they, they had much business and much wealth. It was a place where uh, they were very smart. They had much education. They exported uh, medical things. They had a, a big medical um, school there. And they exported ISAB from one of the mountains that didn't work, by the way, come to find out. But they exported it. People bought it. And it was a very wealthy place, and they had a seaboard close by, and it was just a, a, a place of commerce. It was, it was hustling and bustling. And this passage is written to the church of the Laodiceans, and he says, I rebuke you as a church to be zealous, therefore, and repent. I love you, therefore, I'm giving you this, this, this rebuke to repent and be zealous. I want you to remember that word, be zealous. Have passion. Have passion. He says in verse number 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and him with me. This verse is not a verse about salvation. I'll come in and sup with him and him with me. This is not a verse about salvation. This is a verse about passion. How do we come to that conclusion? We come to that conclusion in this passage, the book book to this, uh, this, this little letter to the church of Laodicea. Um, um, he says, listen, um, remember what he says? He says, um, um, you are neither hot nor cold. You are lukewarm. Because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. You have no passion. Why is that the, the, the number one sin that a church and a Christian can commit? Because when you lose your passion for Christ, and you quit following Christ, what was the number one commandment? The number one commandment was to love the Lord your God. It's not the end. To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. Love the Lord with everything you have. The fact of the matter is, it was such a grievous sin to God that this is the only church where there were no words of commendation. There were no church lay out of saying that said, hey, um, I want to commend you before I correct you. All the other six churches had commendations where God said, listen, before I correct you, I want to give you some words of exhortation. You're doing a good job in this area. You're steadfast in this area. You're doing good in this area. To the church of lay out of saying who had no passion, said, I got really nothing good to say about you. That should strike us to the heart today. Do you remember when you had passion? For whatever. Remember when you had passion in a relationship? Remember, remember when you would sit next to your husband even if you had to sit on that middle console? <laughs> it didn't matter. It did not matter. I mean, you just, you had that passion. Now you take different vehicles. Right? Maybe today you have passion. Maybe it's for a, an, an activity. Maybe you love fishing. You have passion for it. And when a new lure comes out, I don't care how ridiculous it is, when them whopper ploppers come out, you got to have every size and color. No, I'm not moving on. 
Because why? Because you have passion for it. Remember when you had passion for Christ? Remember when you first got saved? When you first got saved and you had to be there, man. You had to be at the church services. You had to be at the activity. You had to be involved. And you had to be doing something for Christ. You had a passion. It just burned you up. You were like in the book of Psalms where it says, The zeal of thy house hath eaten me up. The Bible says here for the church to lay out sins because you are not hot or cold. I want to spew you out of my mouth. I don't have anything good to say about you. I really don't want to have anything to do with you. I would spew you out of my mouth except for you're my people. I want to just be disconnected from you. You really make me ill. That whole spew you out of my mouth. In our city would say, make me want to barf. Make me want to vomit. There are a few things in this world I don't do well. That's one of them. My wife will tell you, when I get sick, she says, you sound like you were going to die. I thought I was going to die. I'll fight it till I will die. One of the few things. Because I had some bad experiences as a child. When I was young, I ate a handful of Morton's rock salt that you make homemade ice cream with. Mm, that'll break you from wanting to get sick. And then I ate a box of decon rat poison that carried me to the hospital. And remember back when they used to have syrup of epicac? You gotta, you've dated yourself if you know what syrup of epicac is. But if you've ever had syrup of epicac, you start getting sick in your toenails. And that's like, Rah! And it's like, no, I will never do that again, ever. That's what God says about his church. You make me sick. That's hard, man. That is hard medicine. And he said, I don't have anything good to say. Because you don't have any passion. You don't care about me. And this is a door we're going to talk about today. This door of Christian passion, which God says is such an egregious sin that it makes him sick. And it's such an egregious sin that it causes people no longer to live like they're Christians. <coughs> what happens? How does this happen? How do we lose our passion for the Lord and what should we do? I want to point out just three things to you this morning. Our first love. First of all, let's remember our first love. Now that was a phrase used in the church of Sardis, this idea of first love. But God references here in Revelation chapter number 13, or 3 verse number 13, he says, And that uh, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches, under the, chain, under the angel of the church of the layout of sayings, write, this, uh, things, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. The, who, the one who's writing this to you is the beginning of the creation of God. He said, remember the beginning? Remember how it used to be? Remember the love and the passion that you used to have for me and for, for the, our relationship together? Even remember back in the very beginning when God created man, when God created man in his own image, in Genesis chapter number 2, and when God would walk with man in the cool of the day, and when man sinned and God still reconciled man, he killed an animal and covered man's sin with the skin of that animal. Remember that God who wanted to have a relationship so bad that time after time throughout creation, he only desired one thing, and that is relationship with you. Genesis 17, 18 says, I will give unto thee and did I see, speaking to Abraham, the land wherein thou art a stranger, the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. I want a relationship with you. In the New Testament, he says the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 16, and or 6, verse number 16. He says, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? He says, Don't, don't have a passion for me. Put away these idols. For you, the temple of the living God, that place where we have communion. For God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God. There it is again. Same words are used in Genesis 17. Revelation 21, 3, he says the same thing. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men here in eternity. He says, And I will dwell with them 
and, I, and they shall be my people, and God himself shall dwell with them, and there it is, be their God. Remember in the beginning when I designed this idea of you'll be my people and I'll be your God? Remember when you messed it up and I made reconciliation so I could be your God and you could be my people? Remember in the New Testament when I sent my son so you could be my people and I would be your God? Now in eternity, I'm going to finally make it to where we can make this thing happen without any kind of sin, with any kind of sin in the way, without any kind of problems in the way that has always been my goal. He's telling the church of I said, remember your first love? Guys, listen, make no mistake about this. Passion is a choice. Remember your first love? But it's only just lost my passion, just lost my love. We'll talk about it here in just a minute, but don't, but at least, at least remember your first love. Remember that time when you had a passion for the living God. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The passion is available. The first love. Here's the problem. The problem is now there's a new love. Here's what happens with passion. The reason passion is lost is that we substitute it for something else. The passion for God is lost when we substitute that passion, that desire, that longing, that activity with something else. What did the church or the Laodiceans substitute that relationship with God for? Look at verse number 17 with me this morning. He says, because thou sayest, first of all, there was a general consensus. People. Well, Brother Tony, listen, here's what happened. Last week at team camp, we had kids get saved. We had people, we had kids make decisions. We see this all the time. People come in, they get saved, they get excited about the Lord, and what do they do? They drop right down to the level of where everybody else is. How many people this morning drug into church? How many people this week are excited about their Christian life? How many people this week have passion? How many people had passion and you started hanging out with Christian people? And that was the doom. Of your passion. I can't tell you how many people who've asked me, Brother Tony, why don't Christians blah, blah, blah? I'm like, you are the they. Don't look at anybody else. You've got to just do what you are going to do in spite of what everybody else does. Because if you're only going to rise to where other people are, you're not going to rise very far when it comes to passion in the Lord. Because people tell you, well, I'm a Christian too. Why are you doing that? You know what they told my dad as soon as he got saved? Don't go off the deep end. Good. My dad almost died of alcohol poisoning three times. That's the doggone deep end. <coughs> Let me encourage you to do this in your Christian life. Go off the deep end. <coughs> Let me encourage you to do this. If you're not going to go off the deep end, at least don't discourage somebody who is. Here's how we do it. Why are you doing that? At least admit it ain't your business. Why are you serving the Lord that much? Or we ask questions like this. Well, you don't have to. Uh, do you really have to? Blah, 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 blah. Don't try to put my fire out because you're like living in the shallow end of the pool. What do you care? At least let me burn. If you're not going to burn, at least let somebody else burn. At least fan the flame with somebody else. I heard one time about a guy sitting in the back. Uh, he was visiting a church and the preacher was preaching. The guy said, hey, Amen. And everybody kind of just looked, looked back at him and like, what is this guy's problem? He did it two or three other times. Finally, a deacon went back and said, man, what's wrong with you? And the guy said, I got it. He said, well, you didn't get it here. <laughs> so be quiet. And listen, that's it, man. That is most church. They know power there to blow the fuzz off a peanut and we don't know what in the world's going on. We got no passion. Why? We lost our first love in lieu of a new love. What is our new love? Whatever everybody else says. Well, this is how everybody else is living. This is what the Christian life just is, but Tony, you just need to accept what is. I just will not do it. 
As Christians today, if we're going to follow the Lord, if we're going to have passion for the Lord, you have to understand you're going to have something that the majority of people who go to church and say they're Christians are not going to have. You're going to do it. And even people who sit in the pew are going to look at you like, mm, mm, mm. They must just not have anybody, any friends. They must not have anything else to do. You're going to have a passion for something. And probably it's going to be, if not the Lord, it'll be other people. It'll be popular ideology. Here's what Jesus said. Thou sayest, who did he mean by thou? You, the church, me, the church. What you do is you decide what's good and right and just by looking at what everybody else says. Here's what you, the collective, the church in Laodicea do. You say, as a group, this is how it ought to be. This is what passion looks like. Comes like the old farmer who told his wife, I told you I loved you when I got married. If I change my mind, I'll let you know. Well, friend, there just needs to be a little more passion than that. No wonder there was a lady who came to a church one time and told the pastor, said, my husband is cold and, and uh, not affectionate and won't even hold my hand, won't do anything. And the pastor was a young pastor, a new pastor, and he wanted to think of something awesome to say and some, some new way to say it. So he told, told the lady, he said, bring your husband in and I'll talk to him. So she brings him in and, um, and he gets up and walks around there and plants a big old wet kiss on that lady and tells that guy, says, now she needs that at least twice a week. And he said, I'll bring it back here on Tuesday and Thursdays. <laughs> Listen, you can't, you can't, you can't accept, you can't take somebody else's passion. It's got to be your passion. But I want to be a part of an exciting church. You don't need to be a part of an exciting church. You need to be an exciting church. You need to be the one. You need to have the passion. You need to be the reason people are on fire. Not just hang around and get warm on somebody else's fire. What happens today is we look around and whatever other people are doing, that's what we'll do. That's the level of our passion is people. The second thing is possessions. That was their second love. Their, their first love was Christ and this focus on salvation. This, this focus on what the Lord had done. Now they looked at people. Thou sayest, what did they say? Thou sayest, I'm rich. I'm increased in goods. I have need of nothing. But I told you I'm going to go to church, but the real truth of the matter is I don't need a whole lot from church. We don't need it until we need it, do we? Then we need it. We're running around like we can't find our car keys. And we're late for an appointment. Yeah, you need it. I need it. We need that passion. How many times in my office have I had someone come in and, and they've been surprised with divorce papers or something and now they're trying to make things right. Now they're trying to make things better. The time is before the problems. Now's the time to make things better with Christ. When we say we have need of nothing, that's the perfect time to get close to Christ. When you don't need or you don't think you need anything, if you don't have passion, you do need something from Christ. Because the worst sin of all is being lukewarm. The worst sin of all is not to have passion. He said, I've got nothing good to say about you as a church because you have no passion. And you used to love me, but now what you love is what other people think. Now what you love is the standard that society has set for you. Now what you love is what you do and what you have. How much of your passion do you put into that? How much of your passion do you put into the vehicle you drive and the house you have and the things that you have? And if we could just have a little bit more. It's amazing. It's our new love. See, when you go to India, they have millions of God in the, gods in the Hindu religion. We go over there and we say, oh man, that's horrible. Such a satanic influence. It's not more of a satanic influence than in the gods we serve here. The gods of the pocketbook, the gods of entertainment. 
the videos. I don't know if you were here on time to see the videos that we watched. There were two testimony videos. One was of a guy who said, man, I used, to, I used to serve the Lord, and I used to just really be involved and really used to just be excited about my Christian life. But now, listen, I just work so much, and I have a wife and, and a kid, and I just don't have that excitement in my life anymore about the Lord, and, and I know I should, and I just got so much to do. The other, and, and this is no conclusion. The next was a, about a girl who, was a, who worked with a, a bunch of sports teams, working in sports medicine and wanted to eventually work in the uh, medical field. She said, just, I'm so busy and I know it's wrong. Does that sound familiar? But Brother Tony, you know, that's just how the world is anymore. We're just so busy. We got so much going on in our lives. Yeah, you have passion. By the way, everybody has passion for something. Do you have passion? For the Lord. Are you just lukewarm? By the way, we're not talking about a church, the Church of Laodicea Saints, who didn't do some Christian stuff. They still did their Christian stuff. Just wasn't their passion. Their passion was what their passion was. It was what other people did. And it was their possessions. And it was their own perceptions. Listen to what he said. You say, I'm rich. I don't, I don't need anything. I have need of nothing. I'm increased in goods. And you know not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. That's what he said. If you write in your Bible, underline this. You know not. The person without passion for God does not think they're rebellious. They think they're busy. The person without a passion for God does not think they're rebellious. They just think they're busy. Well, if the devil could get you to believe just one thing, it would be you're not in a hurry and everything's just fine like it is. But without that passion for God, without that obedience to the first and greatest commandment, Jesus said, to love the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might, Everything else goes wrong from that. Why do people do what they do that is unrighteous and unholy and ungodly? Because they don't have passion to do it. They don't want to do it. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, or, uh, chapter four verse number 6, or 6, verse number 4, Wherefore is there a price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he hath no heart to it? Doesn't want to do it. A new love. And lastly, a renewed love. Passion, and if you don't get anything else today, say, so Brother Tony, I used to be that guy, I used to be that lady. I used to have passion for the Lord. I used to love knowing Him and learning about Him and, and drawing close to Him. I used to love uh, uh, telling other people about Him and being a part of His kingdom work in this earth. And by the way, if you've never had that time, you need to question whether or not you've ever met Him. The Bible says anybody that's come to God must believe that He is. As a reward of those who diligently seek him, if you've never been excited about the Lord, I would question whether or not I've ever met him. See, those people who ever really been in deficient at one time or the other was excited about it. I did a wedding one time, lasted four days, and they were at least excited on the first day. I know I was there. They were at least passionate on that first day. It was all smiles and song. Someone wrote, my true love brought me smiles today, uh, flowers today, and I'm all smiles and song. I must be doing something right, or he's doing something wrong. <laughs> Passion. There's this renewed love. It is possible. Let's look, first of all, just real quickly, at God's love for you. Listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 3, verse number 18, I counsel thee, so now listen, you're not, you have no passion for me. None. You're just going through the motions. You do what you do. I counsel thee, because I love you, I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. You think you're already rich, you're not. 
I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. And white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. And that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eyes out, that thou really may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, be passionate, and repent. Look at God's love for you and I. All through Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, the same thing. I love you. Repent and love me back. That's the message all the way through. Repent and love me back. Listen, I do love you. How many of you have heard of this? Well, I don't. Oh my gosh. I love you. I'm just not in love with you. How about that? I love you. I just don't like you. That is just some, that some village is just completely missing their idiot. That's the kind of love I can do without right there, man. I love you. Just don't want you around. That ain't what God is saying. I love you. I made you for a relationship with me. But that is exactly how we treat God. Lord, I love you. Just don't really like to be around you that much. I'll kind of drop in on you once in a while. No, passion. He said, I want to see that passion that you once had for me. Because I have it for you. It's because of my mercies. You're not consumed. And very lastly, your choice to love him. Again, passion is a choice. Colossians chapter number 3, verse number 1 gives us an idea of how to do this. If ye then be risen in Christ, if you know Christ, if you've gone through the door of salvation, then this is what you do. If you be risen in Christ, then seek those things which are above. Where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above. Not on things of the earth. But Tony, I'm spiritual, just not religious. Religion is the stuff we do for God. We talked about it in the Sunday school class. What you're saying is, I understand some spiritual stuff. I just don't do anything with it. Thank you, I love you. Married to you. Not really intended to stay with you. What in the world kind of relationship is that? Okay. I mean, my bad. Two of seven days. Okay, that's unreasonable. Four of seven days. So 50%. That's off the deep end, if you ask me. What can she expect? What can she expect? Anybody want to guess? How about all of my heart? Think that'd be reasonable? For my wife to expect all of my heart? All of my soul? All of my strength? All of my attention? <clears throat> I think it's completely reasonable. I think it's completely reasonable for a loving God to expect all of our efforts. But Brother Tony, I've got to work. Listen, nobody's telling you not to pay your bills. I'm just telling you that your stuff cannot be your primary passion in this life. Not in follow Christ. Because something will be your passion. What is your affection set on? So here's what he says. Revelation. Revelation chapter number 3 and verse number 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, be passionate therefore, and repent. Behold, he says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him and him with me. He says, I stand at the door. I'm knocking at your door. On the other side of your door, you have people. You have possessions. You have your own perspective. But I'm standing at the door. And if you'll open it up, I'll come in. And we'll have a relationship. And we can fire that passion back up. If you'll just open the door, I'll step through it and we'll do it. Um, there's a piece of artwork at St. Paul's Cathedral in London, England, England that was painted by William Holden, Holman Hunt. And you probably can't see it very well. It's called The Light of the World. It took him two and a half years to paint this picture called the light of the world. 
depicts Jesus standing outside of a path that has not been well kept. Not really expecting many visitors, Jesus is knocking at the door. No one is answering. No one has kept the path. They really don't want anybody there. So someone may mention that he made a mistake in the painting. You probably can't see it from where you are. They said the problem with the painting is there's no door latch on the door. William Holman Hunt said that is not a mistake. That latch is only on the inside of the door. You see today, Jesus is standing at the door, but he will not open that door for you. That's a door that you and I have to open. That's something you and I have to decide on. That's a door, by the way, and I've always said, boy, this door of salvation, Jesus is standing at the door and knocking. If you'll open up, he'll save you. That is not a message about salvation. That's a message about passion. Since you're lukewarm, you've lost your passion, and I'm standing at the door, and I'm knocking, and I want to have this relationship with you. And if you'll open it up, I'll come in and sup with you and you with me. We'll fire that relationship back up. How many of you went to teen camp, came to know Christ, was on fire for God, only to come back to church to have it put out? My group of believers without passion. I wonder, in my own family, if I've been guilty of lack of passion, a bad example. I wonder in my own church, in this world, if I've shown a passion for everything else except for the one thing that's important in this life. It's an egregious sin, a lack of passion. And God, this very day, is standing at the door and not all. Give me an example since they're not here. I'll make sure they're not here. Because they wouldn't want me to tell this give you this example of them think if they were here. They're not. I was at the hospital this last week with uh, Ashley, Ashley Johnson. It's not, what did I say? Did you say Jones? Did you almost tell me to say Jones? Johnson. I said it right this time. Ashley Johnson is not doing well. Whitney Jones was in the hospital for almost six months with a double lung transplant. The week, that's Carl and Kim Jones' daughter. The week she got out, um, Ashley went in. And uh, one of the hospital said, you know what Ms. Jones said? She said, it's just a wonderful God thing. It's like, how in the world? There's no, right now, no path except just a miracle of God of Ashley getting off that respirator except for long transit. I was thinking to myself, how are you fixing to tell me this is a thing of God? She said, it was just a beautiful thing that, that Ashley didn't go into the hospital until after Whitney went out. We didn't have to do both. Who thinks like that? But you know what she told me? She said, I was reading Revelation just a couple months ago about being lukewarm. And she said, just so convicted my heart. I was like, no way. I just, want, I just want to love God more. And where do you get the strength to be in the hospital? Don't make any mistake about it. They've been in the hospital the whole time, making trips back and forth, sometimes twice a day. So now it's the hospital. Where do you get the kind of strength instead of open around? Life is horrible to say, man, isn't God awesome that we didn't have two kids in here at the same time? Where do you get that kind of strength? God and passion. Only place it happens. Where can you get the strength to do the things you need to do in your life? Where can you get the strength to be the person you need to be in your life? It starts with one place, after salvation, opening that door to Christ. That door of godly passion. Remember the day you had it? Or maybe today you need it? You ever had a relationship where the passion was just kind of gone? You 
had to fire it back up again. Maybe today, as Christ is knocking on the door, you need to come down here and answer. Maybe just need to come and say, Lord, I've forgotten you in the book of Hosea. It's exactly what was happening. God tells Hosea, I want you to go and marry a prostitute and have children and build a home. And then as you do that, she's going to lose passion for you and she's going to go right back out to what she was doing before. And then I want you to go and buy her back and pay off her debts. And I want you to marry her again as a picture of how much I love my people. Anybody in here want to do that? Anybody in here want to be that guy? He goes out and marries someone who began as unfaithful. Marry them. They become unfaithful again and go marry them again. Not us. We'd be turning stuff over. They'd be calling the police on us. God says, Hosea, this is what I want you to do, man. Just show the people in a very real way how much I love them. Can you think of anything else that hurts more than somebody being unfaithful? God says, I love you even though you're going out and you come in and serve me. And at the same time, you go out and serve other gods. The God of other people, the God of possessions, the God of your own perceptions. You lost passion for me. Then you come in and act like it's not me. It makes me sick because I know. I know what life really looks like when we leave these doors. Today, if you don't know Christ, it'll be a great day to step through the door of salvation. If you do know Christ, it'll be a great day to renew that passion. So we stand together as the candidates for baptism go back. Musicians sing with heads bowed and eyes closed. What you need. This is my desire. Do you have a desire today to honor, to honor the Lord.